This episode is about a man who went from rags to riches on his way to the highest echelons of British politics, as well as being responsible for some of the most iconic infrastructure projects of the age in this country, and in many ways changed how society operates today. But he was known for gaining large contracts from which he profited personally as a government minister, stocks and shares manipulator, some say a sexual deviant, and tax evader. But he made changes to Britain that are lasting to this day. He was vilified by some, but applauded by others. This is Vinci's Scandals, and the account of the corruption and times of Ernest Marples. A man wobbles out of the pub and walks to his car after a convivial lunch. He spots a traffic warden adhering a fixed penalty notice to the vehicle for parking on double yellow lines. He would love to give the warden a piece of his mind, but he has now vanished. All he can do is mutter, Marples, you should have been strangled at birth. So who came up with the bright idea of double yellow lines? where you can't park at any time. He was a working-class Tory called Ernest Marples and was born in Dorset Road in Manchester in 1907. His father was an engineering supervisor and a labour activist and his mother worked in a hat factory. He was a clever child and won a scholarship to Stretford Grammar School. By the age of 14, he was starting to become active in the Labour Party During his early career, he tried a number of jobs from being a miner, postman, cook and finally an accountant and also dabbled in converting Victorian houses into flats. World War II came and he ended up as a captain in the Royal Artillery before being invalided out in 1944. In 1937, he had married Edna Harwood but they were divorced in 1945. Some years later, he married his secretary, Ruth Dobson. He switched from the Labour Party to the Conservatives, which must have led to frank and business-like conversations with his father. He secured a seat in 1945 for Wallasey. This was very impressive, as the Tories were wiped out in the election that year. In 1957, Harold Macmillan appointed Marples Postmaster General. On the 2nd of June, Marples started the first draw for the new premium bond scheme. At that time, the telephone network was controlled by the General Post Office and saw the introduction of direct dialing, which eliminated the use of operators on national phone calls, and it also had been claimed that he introduced the first postcodes to Britain although these were both actually technical innovations, which probably would have been inevitable, regardless of who the minister had been. After the war, Marple started to enter the civil engineering and construction business, and in the process acquired a five-ton truck and a crane. He founded a company called Kirk & Kirk, but his real break came in 1948, when he met a civil engineer called Reginald Ridgway, who was a contractor on the Brunswick Power Station. They formed a company called Marples Ridgeway, which went on to build another power station in England, a dam in Scotland, roads in Ethiopia and England, as well as a port in Jamaica. On Churchill's return to power in 1951, he secured a junior post in the Department of Housing. The then minister, claimed he could build 300,000 new homes that year. That minister was Harold Macmillan, who would later become Chancellor of the Exchequer and then Prime Minister in 1957. After housing, he was appointed Minister for Pensions and National Insurance and returned to the back benches on the retirement of Churchill. But let us take a closer look at housing as it was at the time. Instead of some inexperienced MP from the back benches, Macmillan now had a junior minister in Marples, who was both an accountant and knew something about construction. 
The new homes were eventually built, and the two men, by all accounts, got on well. When Macmillan became Prime Minister and took up residence in Downing Street, Marples began his real ascent to high office. First he became the Postmaster General, and then in 1959 the Minister for Transport. He held the latter position until the defeat of the Tories in 1964. From then on he was relegated back to the back benches and would languish there for ten years. During his tenure, he introduced parking meters and pedestrian crossings. He was also responsible for WLA lines, traffic wardens, and the breathalyzer test. He was expected to dispose of his shares in his company, so as to avoid any conflict of interest. But Marples was beginning to show a tricky side to his character. At first he wanted to pass his shares over to his business partner, Ridgeway, with an option to repurchase the shares at the original sale price. This was opposed by the Treasury on the grounds that Ridgeway would be the agent for Marples. But this conflict of interest remained. Shortly after becoming a junior minister in November 1951, Marples resigned as managing director of Marples Ridgeway but continued to hold some 80% of the firm's shares. When he was made Minister of Transport in October 1959, Marples undertook to sell his shareholding in the company, as he was now in clear breach of the House of Commons rules. He had not done so by January 1960, at which time the Evening Standard reported that Marples Ridgeway had won the tender to build the Hammersmith flyover and that the Ministry of Transport's engineers had endorsed the London County Council's rejection of a lower tender. Marple's first attempt to sell his shares was blocked by the Attorney General on the basis that he was using his former business partner as an agent to ensure he could buy back the shares upon leaving office. Marple's therefore sold his shares to his wife, reserving himself the possibility to reacquire them at the original price after leaving office. By this time, his shares had come to be worth between three hundred and fifty and four hundred thousand pounds. In nineteen fifty nine, shortly before becoming minister, Marples opened the first section of the M one motorway. It was understood that although his former company was not directly contracted to build the M one, Marples Ridgeway was alleged to have a significant business interest. The company built the Hammersmith flyover in London at a cost of £1.3 million, immediately followed by building the Chiswick flyover. Marples Ridgeway was also involved in other major road projects in the 50s and 60s, including the £4.1 million extension to the M1 into London. The first Transport Act introduced parking metres, provisional driving licences, level crossings, single and double yellow lines, MOT tests, traffic wardens, and a 250cc limit on learner motorcyclists. But it was the second Transport Act that is still controversial to this day. The government finances were not as bad as the late 1940s, but still precarious. In 1945, a delegation from the Society of Motor Manufacturers visited Germany in order to see the famous Autobahn system. They recommended 800 miles of motorways, which included London to Cardiff, London to Carlisle via Birmingham, Bristol to Leeds, and Warrington to Hull. This was shelved until the late 1950s. In 1939, there were two million cars on the road. Despite ten years of austerity, it had risen to just under 3 million. But by 1959, when Marples had become head of the Transport Ministry, it had jumped to 5 million cars. At long last, the public abandoned public transport for the freedom and convenience of the motor car. The country needed all the foreign exchange it could get, and the share of exports of the motor industry had risen from 272 million in 1950 to 617 million 
in 1960. The country's railway system was in dire straits and the canals were in decline. At its height, just before World War I, it boasted 37,720 kilometres of track. But it was losing money at an alarming rate. Its share of the transport market had dropped from 16 to only 5%. By 1963, the British Transport Commission, who oversaw the railways, could not pay the interest on its loans. The Second Transport Act abolished this institution and replaced it with British Railways, with the famous Dr Beeching as chairman of the board. He proposed the closure of 2,363 stations and 8,000 kilometres of railway track, which amounted to a cut of 55% of rail capacity. At the same time, travelling by car, whether for work or leisure, and the transport of goods by lorry was rising by 10% per year. The government had to choose between upgrading either the railway system through electrification or the roads by promoting motorways. It chose the roads, and Marples was in the right place to profit from it. Certain groups opposed the closure of the railways, of which the most famous member was the poet John Betjeman. But the real opposition to Marples came not from a poet, but from motorists. In the autumn of 1963, stickers appeared on cars with the words, Marples must go. Ironically, on the overpass bridge at Luton, the same piece of graffiti appeared. As he had opened the first section of the M1 motorway, this was not lost on the public. For an enthusiast of the motor car, he had upset his natural allies. Objectors, among other things, hated the dreaded traffic wardens and the introduction of drink driving laws in which Ernest Marples appeared on Pathé News advocating the ban, not to mention the introduction of yellow lines on the roads around the country. The public wanted all the positives from the expanding road network without any of the drawbacks. Here was a man with a good track record, if at times controversial. He might not get the keys to number 10, but his prospects were looking good. He survived Macmillan's Night of the Long Knives, in which a number of his ministerial colleagues were sacked and kept his job. The Prime Minister's successor, Alec Douglas Home, kept him on as Minister for Transport, which lasted until the Conservatives lost the election in 1964. Inadvertently, Marples got caught up in the Profumo scandal. The point about transport is that you cannot have secrecy. People need to know about motorways, road closures, tides, airports, ferry and railway schedules. Otherwise the country grinds to a halt. When Lord Denning made his 1963 investigation into the security aspects of the Perfumo scandal and the rumoured affair between the Minister of Defence, Duncan Sands, and the Duchess of Argyle, he confirmed to Macmillan that a rumour that Ernest Marples was in the habit of using prostitutes appeared to be true. In early 2020, the rumours were corroborated by an investigative journalist based on the diaries of Lord Denning's then-secretary, Thomas Critchley. As the report was due to be finalised, a voluntary witness appeared in Whitehall and gave evidence to Lord Denning and his number two, Thomas Critchley. One of her clients was Ernest Marples, and he had unusual tastes. He liked dressing up in women's clothing and being beaten. The transport minister's fetish for being whipped while cross-dressing was described in great detail by one of the prostitutes who had provided these services to Marples and confirmed at the time by her detailed knowledge of the interior of Marples' home at 33 Eccleston Square, where the events had taken place. The story was suppressed 
and did not appear in Denning's final report. After the 1974 election, he never achieved high office again, but continued to court controversy. His elevation to a life peerage of the now Baron Marples should have been the crowning glory of a very successful business and political career. But his misery did not end here. In 1974, 150 cases of fine wine stored under the arches in Brixton went up in flames. What made his predicament worse was that, ironically, he was caught drink driving and received a one-year ban and fined £45. As the then Transport Minister, he had been seen on Pathé News extolling the virtues of foregoing alcohol while driving. But then hypocrisy has never been a barrier to a successful political career. But for Marples, 1974 onwards was a particularly challenging time, and more controversy. Early in 1975, he suddenly fled to Monte Carlo. He left just before the end of the tax year, fearing that he would otherwise be liable for a substantial tax bill. In the early 70s, he had tried to fight off a revaluation of his assets, which would undoubtedly cost him a lot of money. So Marples decided he had to move abroad quickly, and he formed a plot to remove £2 million from Britain through his Liechtenstein company, as there was nothing for it but to get his assets out of the country, which Marples did just before the end of the tax year. He left by the cross-channel night ferry, with his belongings crammed into tea chests, leaving the floors of his home in Belgravia, littered with discarded clothes and possessions. He claimed he had been asked to pay nearly 30 years overdue back tax. The Treasury froze his few remaining assets in Britain for the next 10 years. But by then, most of them were safely in Monaco and Liechtenstein. The rapid departure abroad came at a time when Marples was facing problems on several fronts. Tenants of his block of flats in Harwood Court, Upper Richmond Road in Putney, were demanding that he repair serious structural faults and had threatened legal action. He was being sued for £145,000 by the Bankers Trust Merchant Bank in relation to an agreement made with the French company Ernest Marples et C. He was also being sued by John Holmes, the chartered surveyor and director of Marples property company Eccleston Enterprises, for wrongful dismissal and who was claiming £70,000 in damages. The Inland Revenue was demanding that he pay nearly 30 years back taxes on his residence in Eccleston Street, Belgravia, as well as capital gains tax on his properties in Kensington. His departure came in the wake of the failure of his plan to avoid paying tax on his properties by involving a Liechtenstein-based company with which he had been involved for more than 10 years. And his tenants at Harwood Court threaten legal action over multiple structural defects. He hashed a plan to sell the block of flats for £500,000 to Vin International, who would refurbish and sell them for between two and a quarter and two and a half million pounds. Marples would only be liable for capital gains tax at 30% on the transfer to Vin, which, as an offshore company, would only be liable for stamp duty at 2%. The plan failed, following the change of government in 1974, and after reports were published in the Daily Mirror, the Treasury froze all of his remaining assets, missing out on the ones secreted away in Liechtenstein and Monaco, which were beyond their reach. Also, the surveyor and director of his property company, Eggleston Estates, continued to sue him. But he could not return to the UK, and was now a genuine tax exile. In November 1977, 
he decided to pay £7,600 to the Treasury for breaching exchange control regulations in a deal that allowed him to return to Britain. He has received a very poor reputation over the years as partisans for the railway industry see him as the real villain of the beaching cuts. But the railways were hemorrhaging cash and between 1950 to 1962, 300 branch lines had been closed with the loss of 70,000 jobs. Marple certainly had a conflict of interest in holding on to Marple's Ridgeway shares whilst being Transport Minister. While Dr Beeching is still remembered among the public, Ernest Marple's has largely faded into obscurity. But his time as a minister, though contentious, was necessary so that the country could develop and move forward. His final years were spent either in Monte Carlo or tending to his 45-acre vineyard estate in Fleury, in France. He died in a Monte Carlo hospital on the 6th of July 1978. In his will, he left property valued at around £400,000. He is buried in a family plot in Southern Cemetery in Manchester. Manchester.